Good afternoon, everybody. These two men on the stage are well known to both of you, I'm sure, by now. But I want to start off by asking each of them a question regarding public service and our topic of democracy. When you both look back at your own careers, what was the best job you ever had? Oh, that's easy, uh, in the United States Congress. The best job because uh, the most challenging. You think of every tough issue the country confronts and the Congress deals with it. The best job because uh, you get to work with some marvelous people, even a former director of the budget like uh, Mitch Daniels here, <laughs> uh, but some marvelous people. It's the best job because the challenges come at you with such rapi rapidity and complexity. Uh, the to-do list is never complete. And uh, there's a great satisfaction from thinking that even you're a minor player, as I was, you still uh, are contributing to the direction and success of your country. Mr. President. Well, when you ask me that question in a few years, I hope I'll say president of Purdue University. <laughs> but it's uh, too soon to say, you know. It, it, it all depends on when you look back if you think you did something useful or not, at least to me, that's the only measure. And, um, but I, I guess I'd answer this way. In terms of usefulness to me, um, the, the, one of the jobs I had at Eli Lilly and Company was the biggest line job in the company. I learned so much, was stretched so much, um, and, and, and picked up lessons that I was able to apply later. Um, most gratifying job up to this point, the last one, because I do believe I can tell myself and document it that we did important work for Indiana, turned the state around in certain respects, made it a state of, of, of uh, ambition and, and creativity and progress. But uh, I hope I can give you a different answer in a few years. <laughs> we probably have 80 years of public service sitting on the stage over here. And the main reason for this event is to talk about, it was Dave, David Rheingold's idea, the dean of the uh, liberal arts <clears throat> school, but it's his idea to talk about democracy, and I want to read a paragraph here to start off with, and we're going to get you folks involved in questions very soon. Lee Hamilton wrote this a couple days ago, and the headline is, We Face Real Challenges to Representative Democracy. People who care about the United States' place in the world often fret about challenges to representative democracy from other countries. I'd contend that the more formidable challenge comes not from abroad, but from within. You want to explain a little bit more what you're after? I think uh, representative democracy is one of the monumental achievements in the history of mankind. It's a really important uh, concept and uh, has played an enormous role in the world and, of course, for this country. But one of the things about it is that uh, I think it's very hard to make it work. And it's hard to make it work because we're a very big country. When I went to high school, we had 130 million people or, or thereabouts, and that's a long, long time ago. I don't know what the figure is now, but it's somewhere around 315 million. So in my working lifetime, the country is far more than double. But not only that, the country has become so much more diverse, complex. And uh, making that country work is hard. It's uh, representative democracy. It's also hard because the people so often want mutually contradictory things. They want to balance the budget. They don't want to cut defense spending. They don't want to cut entitlements. They don't want any new taxes. It's pretty hard uh, to run a country that way. Uh, they want to rein in Wall Street, but they don't want to have any more regulations. And uh, so politicians are really dealing with a very uh, uh, a population that's very restless. And, and as the Republican primaries have shown, the candidates are dealing with an angry public. Uh, so we've got a lot of challenges, Brian, to make this country of ours work. And uh, it's a formidable task. The future of democracy is fragile. 
I compare it to a flower. It takes a lot of nurturing. It takes a lot of weeding out. It takes a lot of gardening. It takes a lot of attention. And it isn't written in the stars somewhere that uh, representative democracy is always going to prevail and prosper. We've got to make it work. So we all have a burden. A few years ago, uh, a few times, uh, I was approached from different directions. People say, you know, you really ought to write a book. I said, well, what kind of book you got in mind? They would usually say, oh, you know, how to, uh, how to make a state successful, how to make government perform, et cetera, et cetera. I said, no, I, somebody else can write that book. I said, if I was going to go to the trouble of writing a book, I'd write about what really bothers me, and that's this subject. And ultimately, I did. And I called it Keeping the Republic from a famous uh, statement uh, attributed to Ben Franklin allegedly, apocryphally maybe, leaving uh, Constitution Hall after they signed the Constitution, he was asked by a woman, what, what, government, what kind of government have you given us? And he said, Madam, a republic if you can keep it. He knew, and if you look at the, what the founders wrote, they were profoundly conscious of the fact that this was going to be a fragile system they set yeah. up. I remember I had a big wrestling match with the publisher because I wanted to have a short chapter at the front that looked back historically. And they said, no, nah, no, no, you know, they wanted, I said, no, I, I said, it's gotta be there. I said, I'm not the great historian of philosophy or political thought, but I know this much. I know that, the, that, that um, this whole idea of go government by the consent of the governed is, is new on the scene historically. It is not the nature of the world. As I told 300 high school students down in Vincennes this morning, uh, the nature, the, the natural order of things is tyrants and autocrats and kings and despots. And, and uh, this idea of government by the consent of the government has come, has come on the scene only recently, and it, there, throughout history there have been skeptics that you could make it work for long. And 220 or 240-some years is not long. So, yeah, I worry about it. I think that the tensions that Lee talked about are not surprising, uh, but we have to have institutions that can manage these irreconcilable right. desires. And historically, we have had them, but there are reasons, multiple reasons, to worry that our institutions today uh, do not enable the reconciliation of interests. To use a word nobody likes to use these days, the compromises that have historically enabled a free people to govern themselves effectively. Lincoln said, uh, whether this nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure, he asked that question at Gettysburg. But it's still the operational yeah. question. It's still the question that uh, we should be concerned about. Whether this nation so conceived, so dedicated can long endure. It's not a sure thing. And one of the many ironies is the founders saw this coming. Lincoln saw this. That the, it's the very success of free institutions that can be their undoing. It, our free institutions have produced unimaginable bounty in this country. And that can produce a, um, a set of attitudes which is not conducive to the continuation of those free institutions. I want to ask one more question, and then if those of you who want to ask questions, somebody could step up to the mic right after that. We can get on to... Uh, the audience's question, but you wrote this also in this uh, blog that you write. Um, we face other challenges as well. Too much money is threatening the core values of representative democracy. And too many Americans have become passive and disengaged from politics and policy. Representative democracy is not a spectator sport. While the basics, voting, keeping oneself informed, communicating with officials, Getting involved in organizations that promote the causes we believe in, improving other, our communities are crucial. They aren't always enough. Start with the money thing. How bad is that situation, and will that ever change? Well, I worry about it. Uh, I think one of the major developments during my period in public life has been the increasing importance of money in the system. Now, you're not going to ban money from the system, nor should you. But uh, I think it has a disproportionate influence today on legislators and people in the executive branch as well. And I think it contributes in no small manner to the uh, general attitude of the public 
that uh, our government's not working very well, both the legislative and the executive branch. And that's not new, it goes back decades, but uh, it's very strong now. So I, uh, the, the system is awash in money. And the advice to follow the money is very good advice. If you see the Congress handling a regulatory bill of some kind, all you've got to do is watch the contributions coming in to the committee that deals with that regulation. Money is very sophisticated, very pointed, and the payoff can be huge. So I worry about it. Is it the end of the republic? No, of course it is not. How do you get it under control? I don't think I have a good answer for it. I, I would have much more disclosure. A few years ago, everybody supported disclosure, but not anymore because a lot of donors don't want to be disclosed. I personally would support uh, public financing, matching funds. I think that's quite unpopular by and large. So I worry a lot about the money and what it's doing to the system uh, of our government. Uh, something we've really got to keep our eye on and see if we can restrain in some way. Uh, what, if I, as a donor who gives a lot of money, increase my power, my ability to impact the system, what that means is the ordinary person's power is diminished, has less. That's not the direction you want to go. I'm not happy about where we are. It's not uh, at the top of my worry list about our, about our democracy. There are items that I worry about a great deal more. And in terms of the innards of politics, the, uh, the uh, lack of competitive districts legislatively, which then leads to, uh, on, on both sides, people can't, you know, competing. The real competition is to the fringe as opposed to for the middle. And, uh, and the polarization, the, the, the lack of interaction that, that that leads to, I think, is a bigger problem. You know, I've admired, and, and uh, so Congressman Hamilton and I came from, wore different uniforms, but I've admired him forever, and more often than not found myself in, a, in agreement with, with things he said, but, when he, and things he advocates. But you find that less and less these days. There are, there are uh, people who have divided, they're encouraged, by the way, by technologies that were supposed to bring us more varied information now tend to bring us <laughs> the information we agree with and fortify as opposed to challenge what we think, whether you're on the left or the right. All that, I think, is a, is a somewhat bigger problem. I don't, uh, the history of com campaign finance legislation is not, a, is not a successful one. There's a lot of unintended consequences and been a lot of reforms that were supposed to fix this, and instead they brought about the situation of today. So, um, uh, I, again, I would assign greater uh, causality to other things, but it's... Uh, well, he's I'm right not, about, you know, Mitch is right about that. The uh, campaign finance laws that have been passed have not been very effective. And so we don't have the, I don't have the solution to it. I think I'd take a stab at it, but, uh, and uh, I'd also agree that there are a lot of other really important problems, but th this is one that I am concerned about. And the thing that, Lee, that's kept me from ever seriously uh, embracing the idea of public finance is I'm, very, I'm deeply suspicious when politicians write the rules that what they really have in mind is protecting themselves, and there has <laughs> been some of that, and, and you know, there huh. may be a public finance system that doesn't do that, but a lot of them absolutely yeah. make it less likely that an incumbent can be challenged from the outside. And, Whatever the right answer is, that isn't it. Yeah. Need a question and tell us who you are, please. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Maisha Chowdhury, and I am a junior studying human relations communications in the Brian Lamb School of Communication. Um, I had a question. Uh, since a lot of us in this room are college students and we are registering to vote and getting ready for 2016, how can we um, improve voter turnout at the polls for 2016? How can we improve? Um, voter turnout. Voter turnout. The what? Voter turnout. Voter turnout. Oh, well. Well, the first thing is you've got to remove the barriers between the uh, citizen and the ballot. We 
cutoff registration, whatever it is in Indiana, three weeks ahead of time. There's no reason for that. Uh, with today's abilities, you could, a lot of people have same day registration. That is, you can register right up to the time you vote. So that's part of it. You uh, cut off voting in this state at 6 p.m. That's really ridiculous. Uh, means it's very hard for a lot of people to get to the polls. So you can extend the time, whatever it be, eight, nine o'clock is usual in a lot of states. Indiana and Kentucky have the earliest cutoff date, 6 p.m. of uh, any state in the union. So you have some legal barriers that I think could be reduced or even removed. But that's not the big problem. The big problem is people are uh, cynical. Uh, people don't think voting counts. And that's a motivational problem that's hard to get at, very hard to get at. The easy answer is uh, if politicians perform better, people would probably participate more, but that's <laughs> not the easiest thing to bring about. Uh, so we got to attack the motivational problem when you vote, you do three things. You, you vote for a person, a candidate. You vote for a policy, direction. The third thing you do is the most important. You confirm the system. And we're at a point now, you all know that Indiana's at the bottom here in terms of voter turnout in recent elections. That's not permanent, that'll change, the figures jump around, but it's worrisome, isn't it? And so I think we need to put a lot more attention on removing the barriers and tackling the problem of uh, motivation as best we can. Maisha, thank you for the question and for caring. I, um, I'm, I'm for further changes in access, but I don't think we have an access problem. I vote I haven't voted on election day since I took this job. I vote right out down the hall and I can do it 30 days ahead of time. In fact, a good question is maybe I shouldn't be allowed to. I might learn something in those 30 days that change my mind. If I'm one of the rare people who could actually change his mind. So. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I'm not too troubled by that anymore. I mean, uh, uh, but, um, but the, motiv the motivational part is, is absolutely key. Right. And on that, I guess I'd say two things. Um, first of all, when we have more, if we ever have more competitive elections, we have turnout. I, I happened to, I only ran for office, one office, I only ran for it two times. But the second time, we had the biggest turnout in the history of Indiana, it's just a few years ago. Why? Because there was spirited, competitive elections. People felt strongly on both sides. And, uh, and uh, so um, I remember we received more votes than anybody ever has for any office in the history of the state. It wasn't because we got the highest percentage. It was because the, the electorate was so big that year, plus a high percentage. So, <laughs> yeah. So um, that's one. But the, the main thing I would say is that, you know, in my opinion, if ever a generation had a reason to vote, it's yours. And Lee has written a lot about it. I'm a nag about it. Your generation is being treated very unfairly. You're, you're going to have a mountain of debt to deal with. The average student loan we worry about, $27,000 to $30,000. You, are, you, are, you may not have a student loan, but you already owe twice that much in government debt. And it wasn't, it wasn't borrowed and spent for your future. You could justify it if it had been spent on infrastructure and and long-term assets that would be there, only a small percentage, some of the national security qualif qualifies as that. And so, the, boy, if there was ever a reason for a generation to bestir itself and say, you know, uh, this isn't right and we should take action now, we should at least demand action of those who are in a position to act on our behalf, I think you have that you have that uh, motivation, that latent motivation, but it's not, you know, you're, it's not been aggressively explained, and, and uh, I don't blame anybody uh, in your cohort for not seeing the problem yet. Next question. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. My name is, my name is Michael Turinetti. 
Uh, I'm studying in the College of Liberal Arts here, uh, political science and sociology. My question touches on something that President Daniels spoke about, uh, which is this idea of competitive elections. And my question to both of you is this. If we were to, for example, abolish the Electoral College and force a 50-state competitive race, would that improve turnout by forcing, say, a Democrat to actually campaign in Vermont and New Hampshire as opposed to uh, barely touching those states or a Republican in Oklahoma or Kansas? Well, we don't have a national election anymore for president. If you look at where president's candidates go, they go to 10 states, basically. There's no great reason for a Democratic candidate for president to come to Indiana. It's going to vote Republican. It uh, didn't in 08? Uh, occasionally, you know, 08, <laughs> 64, when Johnson carried it. Uh, but if you go back to the beginning of the century, it's basically Republican. In any event, don't take my word for it. Take the word of the candidates. They analyze these things pretty carefully, and they don't come here except to raise money. Uh, and it's true in all kinds of states. So they come, the election comes down to about 10 states. Um, that concerns me. I favor direct elections. I don't think the world's greatest democracy should be afraid of democracy. And I'd like to see us now. Will it happen? The answer is no. The answer is no because there are a lot of interest groups that benefit from the Electoral College and know how to use it. Some are on the liberal side and some on the conservative side. But as you know, it takes a constitutional amendment and that's very, very tough to do. So that's kind of off the boards in a sense. But personally, I would support it and I would think you would get more vigor in the population if you had more competitive elections throughout the country. Would the country benefit? I don't, I don't want to be a pessimist here. I think this is a great country. And I think the Electoral College has served us pretty well because if you look at the presidents, we've done pretty well in uh, our selection of presidents. So what I'm arguing for is a bit radical, I suppose, but uh, I would lean that way. But I also know that it's kind of an academic question at this point. This may be one of the questions I can change. I have changed my mind about a little, Michael, and you've given good, good reasons why. I mean, it's absolutely true. I mean, take another example. Um, somebody's going to vote for the Republican nominee in California this year. Probably eight or ten million people, their votes will count for absolutely zero because there's zero chance of all of those electoral votes, um, uh, you know, being awarded to that candidate. And um, so, that, so that's a lot of America not to spend any time on. But but people won't. Um, and um, uh, I think the reason, I can't disagree w with Lee, that this is highly, highly improbable. I thought, oh, I think the reason is the U.S. Senate and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and smaller states that say, no, no, we got, <laughs> this is, it was there to protect us, and by the way, we like it now. And um, that, to me, looks like the, the real barrier. But uh, your diagnosis, I think, is accurate. And I just don't know if you can get the patient to take the prescription. <laughs> Thank you both. Paul? Congressman, in your book, uh, How Congress Works and Why You Should Care, you talked about over the years when you were in Congress, you talked about at times there's a cocoon of warmth and how... I'm sorry? You said there was a cocoon of warmth and how Congressman Bray helped you out and there was compromise and you got things done. In an editorial you had... Oh, a couple months ago, you talked about the 1948 Do Nothing Congress that passed over 900 bills, and our most recent one, about 300. In your editorials, are you starting to become, uh, am I reading you're a little disappointed or disheartened, or are you just saying this is part of the process that we've seen over time in Congress? Um, you're, you're, you're concerned about... Uh, I'm not sure I understand. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Are, have you, in the 10 years since you published your book, yeah. have, you started, have you become disappointed in what Congress has not been able to do because of gridlock? Yes, I am. I don't think the Congress is working. And uh, that's not the fault of the Republican leadership. It's been happening for 
30 years, 40 years. And uh, the thing that worries me most about it, and I've become increasingly concerned about it, is the timidity of the Congress. It simply does not, in any sense, measure up to a co-equal branch of government today. Congress defers all the time to the president, way too much, and is not asserting itself, in my view, under Democratic or Republican leadership. Let's take the issue of the war. Congress spends two months debating the Iran agreement, as they should. That's an important issue. What has Congress done on fighting the war against ISIS? The answer is nothing. They have not expressed themselves. They have said, Mr. President, it's all yours. You decide when to go to war, but beyond that, you decide how to go to war. And we're just going to stand back here and uh, take pot shots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not a co-equal branch of government. That's a timid branch of government. And this deference to the president is something that has begun to distort our constitutional system. I think, I'm not against a strong president. I think the system works best when you have a strong Congress and a strong president and you have tension between the two. I don't expect a miracle here. George Washington did not even think it necessary to send a budget to the United States Congress. It wasn't his job. Today, the president has become the chief budget maker. And no matter what the Congress says about his budget being dead on arrival, that's hooey. The fact of the matter is 95, 99% of that budget will be approved by the, put together by the president. So in all sorts of ways, the Congress is not living up to its responsibility, and I write a lot about that. I am concerned about it. I want to see members, uh, if, if there's a candidate for Congress out here, <laughs> you want to ask them about, are they going to support this bill or that bill, liberal, conservative, or whatever. You know what I'm interested in? I'm less interested in those questions than I used to be. I want to see a good conservative elected. I want to see a good liberal elected. But what I want to see is a member of Congress who believes in the institution of the Congress as a co-equal branch of government. And I am weary <laughs> of timidity, of an unwillingness to carry the responsibility that the Constitution puts on the institution. Mr. President. Can't improve on that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my name is Jenny Jackson, and I'm a senior studying public relations in the School of Communication. And my question touches on um, timidity, but within my generation. I know that there are a lot of students my age, at least in like the 18 to 25 year old, that don't want to go out and vote. And I mean, we touched on this earlier, but what's going to happen to the state of democracy if we never get them to vote? How does that change our government if we just have a lack of motive, like, I guess a lack of motivation, but it never picks up when we get older? President Daniels, why don't you start? Well, I think Maisha's question gave us a chance to talk about this, Jenny. I, uh, um, I, uh, although in my, I, in my private moments, I have my uh, uh, concerns. Uh, the last few years haven't been uh, encouraging in this respect, but uh, I still believe the good sense of the American people will reassert itself. There's, a self, there's some self-correcting mechanisms in our, in our system. Those people who put this together were pretty smart. People who don't study history, and I worry that way too many of our of today's Americans, adult and young people, just have, ne have never been exposed to the wisdom in depth of, of the system that the congressman's been describing. Um, you know, federalism is, a, is one great example for self-correction. 
If state A screws up badly enough, long enough, they will observe that states B and C have a different approach, and sooner or later their citizens will say, let's be like them. And similarly, the, uh, I do believe that, that uh, we've seen um, periods of complacency before and despondency or uh, cynicism before. And I, too, understand why people out there are. Lily Tomlin used to say, no matter how cynical I get, I can't keep up. Uh, it's not a new, that was a long time ago. It's not a new uh, worry. But I, I do believe that uh, sometimes that arou those arousals come from, uh, come from anger or discontent. And I think it's going to happen for your generation. Sooner or later, you, your folk, in, uh, uh, since this generation doesn't seem able to uh, deal with these problems, um, I, I think as, as you rise to leadership, you will, and, and you will render strong, stern judgment on those who let them grow as, as they did. I think Mitch makes a very important point, and that's a, a, the rhythm of our country. Uh, there are times of passivity, and there are times of action. And we are at a moment now when uh, everybody says, uh, including me, the Congress not working very well. That's not permanent. We still, the core strength of our representative democracy is still present. And uh, Mitch, I think, is right when he says we'll see a reassertion at some point. Uh, now, young people have to understand what's at stake here. Why does a politician pay so much more attention to people over 65 years of age <laughs> than they do to you? It is because the politicians understand who votes, that's why. And so they're very responsive to older people because they tend to vote very well. I voted to reduce the voting age to 18. I'm not at all sure I'm right about that. Now, nobody's going to vote against that anymore. <laughs> but I look at the figures of the 18-year-olds to 2021 20, who go to the polls, and it's pretty distressing. And it makes me wonder if I did the right thing, <laughs> yeah, frankly. Yeah. Well, I think I'd vote again to do it, but I am disappointed in the turnout. And young people have to understand that they have a lot at stake. If they participate, the politicians are going to be more responsive to them. They know that 60, 70-year-olds will vote at a very high percentage, and 18 and 20-year-olds will vote at a very low percentage, and they pay attention to that. Hi, Chris Kalash. I'm a graduate student in political science. Um, I'm very curious about the fact that a very small number of members of Congress are now able to pull the leadership one direction or to the other. I was very curious if you had any ideas about changing the power dynamic between the leadership and the caucus to be able to try to get rid of some of the dysfunction, and also if you had any advice to the new and upcoming Speaker of the House of how to <laughs> deal with these issues should they come up again. Well, I've got a ton of advice. Uh, <laughs> nobody will pay any attention to it, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to hold the leadership of the Congress responsible for the performance of the Congress. They're the ones that make the key decisions. And I think over a period of time, the leaders of the Congress have not been leaders, but followers. In other words, they go back to their caucus, they get the drift in the caucus, and they're pretty good at that, and that's what position they take, rather than leading out on an issue. So I want to see bolder leadership uh, in both parties, actually, than we've had. That's a very easy thing for me to say, very difficult for a leader to do, uh, but I'm uh, very concerned about the quality and the vigor of leadership. And I don't mean that in a partisan way at all. I think it's a problem in both parties. Uh, I think you and I have a role in this. I know a lot of members of Congress who run for office. 
I think you and I have to put them on the spot about what kind of a role they see uh, they should take in the institution. And the institution's not going to change unless the rank and file changes and tells the leadership they've got to step up to the bar, which they don't do. This is a very serious problem when you have a Congress of the United States that doesn't work. It has been since 1997 since the Congress passed a budget. Since that time, they have punted. They used the continuing resolution and the omnibus bill which basically just pushes the ball down the road, kicks the can down the road. That's what they did a few days ago till December 11th. They are now working on an omnibus bill or a continuing resolution for two years. The characteristic of an omnibus bill or a continuing resolution is that it basically just keeps the budget as it is with some important changes. Uh, the world's greatest democracy cannot pass a budget. <laughs> it's a little exaggerated, but not much. And as a result of that, American leadership in the world faces a formidable challenge. Why is it there's so much interest in China? Because China has a different model. <clears throat> we don't like that model. It's too autocratic. It's too dictatorial, it's too repressive. But their economic growth rate is much, much greater than ours. Smaller base, but nonetheless impressive growth rate. So we're being challenged in this country for world leadership in a way that should deeply concern us and America has to get rid of its dysfunctionality and begin to perform better, or we will not be able to lead as we would like to lead in the world. That's how I have envision it. So you didn't expect a sermon when you asked, <laughs> asked the question, but I gave him one anyway. Mitch, you've never done that, I'm sure, but... Uh, oh, I've been guilty, but not, to, not today. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. That was a good question. I wandered a little bit from your question that uh, leadership is the key. Hi, my name is David Pay. I'm in the School of Industrial Engineering. And um, in the very beginning of the discussion, both of you kind of alluded to um, your concern for money in, go in government and also just uh, the resiliency of the republic throughout time. And it kind of reminded me of, I think it was Aristotle who you know, gave, gave the, the sequence of governments that happen. And I would like to point to two events, mostly you know, within the last 40 years, the supposed growth of economic inequality in terms of income and things like that. And also this recent decision with Citizens United. Do you see that trend happening today? And if you do, what are some ways? Well, what's that, the second one? Uh, the Citizens United decision in oh, 2010. Oh. President Daniels? First, let me tell you how happy I am to hear an industrial engineer who's read Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. <laughs> Was it, was it David? Yeah, David. Yeah, yeah. Hats off, David. Go for it uh -huh. and multiply. I mean, no, that's, uh -huh. I, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious. It's a, it's a challenge we face here. I'm not changing the subject, but, uh, you know, we, we have far too many students who leave here and wouldn't have a clue what you just said. You know, they, they'd be brilliant at, uh, you know, some technological uh, discipline they've mastered, but they, they just missed all that. And so, first let me say thanks for having studied enough to be able to ask that question. Those are not the things that bother me the most. I'm, I'm much more bothered by the, the, by the things that bothered, for instance, Plato, who predicted, you know, this, this silly, this, this cute idea of consent of the governed just won't run for very long because, he said, uh, you know, people will start living day to day regardless of tomorrow. You need, you need leadership, strong, you know, philosopher king leadership for that. Um, you know, others have come at it more or less the same way, that pretty soon 51% will figure they can loot the other 49, figuratively speaking, and you'll spend yourself broke. Well, there's evidence that we've gone a certain distance in that direction. I think that the, uh, the challenge for uh, our uh, Republican form of government uh, is to, uh, I, I see it in two dimensions. 
One dimension is somebody has got to start uh, talking about the long term. No one I know in, in my generation or the one after, the ones between our, us, would knowingly want to conclude they had plundered the, the young. But they don't know because they've been misled by their politicians a long time. People don't even know how these entitlement programs Lee writes about work. They don't know that it's you paying for me. It's not that I put some money away and I'm just getting what I deserve. I'm getting way more than I deserve, see? So um, I don't blame people who have been actively misled about questions like that for not understanding, but somebody's got to help them understand. And um, secondly, uh, somebody's got to start speaking the language of inclusivity politically. Um, we have never been so divided as today, and, and our leadership all the way to the top seem to spend every day castigating somebody else and dividing and, you know, stereotyping and so forth. And the problems that we have uh, will, will, uh, can only be solved, in my opinion, by, by drawing together people, getting folks to set aside honest differences on other things and try to do a couple, three big things to ensure that you inherit a, a strong country and a free country. And um, right now we haven't, we haven't heard that from either side. You know, I, I want to equate it to the dimensions of the problems we're facing nationally. But this state faced a lot of problems. Was Some of us thought kind of stuck in the mud a decade ago. And we learned, I think, over and over again, big change requires big majorities. You better try to get people more than 50% plus one together if you want to go do things that are hard and things that are long-term, not just for today. You know, somebody said leadership, which Lee keeps bringing us back to, more than, you distill it all down, it's the art of getting people to do what they'd rather not do. <laughs> but they finally come to understand, yes, that's probably the right thing to do. And, and that's been in short supply across our spectrum, and I hope it shows up while we got time. Thank you. I worry about inequality. We now have a generation this is an approximation of American citizens who have not had a raise in their entire working career. At the same time, you've had an explosion at the top in income. How long can that go on? I don't think it means the country comes apart tomorrow or next year or five years from now. But just think of that trend. And what it'll mean is anger and uh, social disrest and all the rest, unless we begin to address it. Now, the way of addressing it is tough. And the tools of uh, policymakers are not very good or very precise here, but I, I think it's a worrisome trend in America today. But I want to say in answer to the question that we have to focus here on the core strengths of representative democracy. The system is not at fault. It's the way we're using the system. And the core strengths are it's based, as you know, on the consent of the governed. Mitch has mentioned that several times. That's exactly right. It's a system that strives for justice. It's a system that wants liberty and justice for all. It's a system that tends to force politicians to come together, not drive them apart, by and large. And it's a system that has served us very well. I want to say a word in addition to this about compromise and negotiation. The problem in the Congress today is there's a kind of an unreality about the political reality. The political reality is you've got a Democratic president. The political reality is you've got a Republican Congress. The political reality is that it takes 60 votes to do anything in the United States Senate, 67, if you want to override a veto. The political reality is you've got to have, what is it, 200 and 90 votes uh, to override a veto or something like that. So in other words, in order to get anything done in this environment, this political environment, which the voters have put into place, you have to compromise and negotiate. 
Otherwise, it's gridlock. And so I want politicians to recognize the political realities. Now, I, I think Mitch said a little earlier, compromise is a dirty word. I guess it is. But we've got a big country that's very diverse and uh, you, you cannot go forward unless you compromise. And politicians, good politicians can protect their principles without compromising. They, look, when you sit down in a negotiation, there are some problems before you that you cannot solve. You can't solve them. You put them off. It's not an easy decision what you do, but you can't solve everything. There are some problems that are relatively easy to solve. You can get a consensus pretty quickly. Then you've got a lot in the middle where you try to make some progress and it's not easy to do. But it has to be done. Otherwise, the country screeches to a halt. I know we got four questions, I think we, but I got a, a quick postscript yeah. on inequality. Bothers me too, although um, not quite in the way it's sometimes portrayed. The data is sometimes misleading and often misused. Yep. You know, there's a lot of That's income right. we don't count and so forth that we, that we quite admirably transfer to people who don't have as much. So that, that's so the, but the part of it that bothers me is the loss of the sense of optimism of upward mobility. That's what America's always yeah. had. And it undergirds the confidence in our whole system. I would love to believe that Americans have always been so passionate, patriotic, believed in their country, that people have come here from other shores as they still wish to because they read the Federalist Papers. <laughs> And they said, that's the, that's the system consistent with human dignity. That's the kind of government I want to live under. That did not happen in most cases. So uh, what happened was people saw it working, and working in terms of having enough freedom, first of all, that the economy grew, and secondly, that people were free to move up in it. Yeah. And so what worries me is, first of all, we have built up some structures which, um, which you know, protect incumbent companies against new starts in too, too often, regulations which are big companies are happy about because it, they can afford the lawyers and other people can't, all that mess. And we're just not growing fast enough. I mean, we've, this is the most anemic, pathetic recovery, so-called recovery, from a deep recession we've ever seen. We have a smaller percentage of people working today than we have since 1977, and it's headed backwards to the days of the stay-at-home mom. That bothers me as an economic matter, but it really bothers me in terms of the confidence in the system. And, and so, my view, in order to restore the democracy um, that we have loved, we need a prolonged period of stronger economic growth, and we should be making every policy call in that direction until further notice. This country will not be ruined by a prolonged period of high economic growth, but the converse is not true. And yes. that takes investment, uh, you said earlier, in yeah. R&D, investment in infrastructure, yeah. investment in the private sector for sure. Yeah. Uh, and one other thing Mitch just said, I think it's terribly important. The key to this is opportunity, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you, you want, that's the way you restore confidence. So every one of you as Purdue students, when you get out of here, you feel like you've got great opportunities before you. That's what you want. All Purdue students do. All produced it. <laughs> <It's, laughs> everybody else we're worried about. Be, because we have only about 12 minutes left, I'd like to have each of you just quickly state your name and give us a sense of what you want to hear about, and then we'll, we'll eliminate the rest of the line just because we don't have any time. Thank you, guys, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Matthew Javorowski. I'm a communications major here. And I want to know basically what your thoughts on um, third-party independent candidates will be in the uh, upcoming future with a growing number of in the uh, young voter class. Okay, thanks. Next. Oh, um, I'm Patty O'Callaghan. My uh, cousin, Captain Daniel O'Callaghan, was a firefighter lost in 9-11, and I want to thank mm -hmm. you for your work in... Uh, on the 9-11 Commission, but also um, the fact that there are so many bills that would pass. There are enough votes to pass, but are um, but haven't been called for a vote, one of them being the 9-11, um, the first responders, a health fund bill. 185 sponsors, but would not be called down for a vote. Thank you. Next. 
My name is Manas Taliarkin, and I'm a student at Purdue Polytech. Uh, my question is, how can my generation research in an unbiased way what some of the candidates are about and then actually recognize them when we go and vote for them? Hmm. Michael Brownstein, I am a PhD student in political science. I would like to ask about media segmentation and the idea that if you're liberal, you can listen to liberal sources. If you're conservative, you can listen to conservative sources. And how can we mitigate the problem in such a way where people are seeing similar information and not just what they're seeing that's biased. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That's good. Hi, Liz Torbett, senior, currently in high school. I was wondering how you feel about a great leader. If they compromise, or do you think that they will be more well-respected by the people if they don't compromise and stand firm to what they believe in? Thank you, Liz. Let's start with the last one first. Uh, Mr. Daniels, a great leader. Well, Liz, great question. Um, the uh, shortest answer I can give you is that uh, I don't think a person can, uh, can lead successfully and, and will only remember people as great leaders based on results, you know, I think. Um, and they may be great for other reasons. You may admire them, but they won't be thought of as a great leader unless they led Somebody somewhere, somewhere different and better. And uh, I don't think that can happen without a firm sense of purpose, a compass. Um, uh, someone said that the great leader must know him or herself and know the times. And so occasionally people appear who have a, a, a set of answers, a set of views that, seem, that does match the times, but then uh, almost never does somebody get 100% of what they wanted. So I worked with someone I think already is recorded in history as a very successful leader, agree with them or not, but President Reagan made enormous history in a positive way for this country. And he was seen as, oh, very, very principled and strong-minded, but he was always willing, and I could cite many, many occasions when he, today people would say, violated his principles. But what he really did was, he said it all the time, if I can get 80% of what we want um, and bring people along, it will do it, and then we'll move on to the next one. So um, if you're looking for a yes, no, I can't give it. I have to say both. Um, a great leader won't be, won't be great with, without both of those. Mr. Chairman. Well, when we do this next year, let's talk, uh, take the subject of leadership. It's really a big one. And uh, Mitch has hit on some high points. Lincoln is supposed to have said, uh, I don't know whether he ever did or not. Everybody attributes all kinds of stuff to Lincoln, but uh, he's, he's supposed to say that the art of leadership in a democratic society is to be out in front, but not too far out in front. Yeah. And there's a lot of truth in that, uh, but I, I think Mitch has talked about leadership very well. I, on, on a couple of the other points, Brian, one of them about the third party is of special interest to me now. I'm working on that with a group of people to try to open up the debates. You're working on me. Yeah, we're working on you. You're I on know. the board, aren't you? Well, I am now. Uh, I wish I'd never said but yes. We, look, the, the, <laughs> the American people have moved away from the political parties. And we have traditionally set up a system that really favors the two political parties for all kinds of understandable reasons. I think you're faced a new situation in the country today, and that is there are a solid majority of people who don't like the Republicans and don't like the Democrats. We've got to get a system now that lets other voices into the debate at the highest level for the President of the United States. And that's a complicated question of how you do it, uh, but I, I want to see the system opened up a little more, and I think, Mitch, you probably share that. Uh, I, I do. I'm, I, uh, um, this, uh, this is another question on which I think my own thoughts have migrated some. I mean, no one should take lightly the advantages this country has um, reaped from having a stable two-party system. Spend any time in a fragmented parliamentary system, yeah. with multi, you know, proliferating parties and constantly shifting uh, coalitions, and nobody can stay you know, prime minister for very long, all that. And, and you'll see some virtues in what we've had. But um, I'm not sure they match the moment now, especially when the parties have separated so completely. Um, there, there's really nobody left. Not, people have been count tabulating this over recent years. There's nobody left 
that, that overlaps. You can't find, right, in Congress, a Democrat whose record is uh, more like a Repub any Republicans than his own party and vice versa. So, you know, I reviewed a book for, uh, for the Wall Street Journal this summer um, uh, that uh, looks at American history and points out that um, it's not as smoothly continuous as we sometimes like to think. There have been earthquakes. <laughs> And this, this uh, person identified the Jefferson-Jackson um, sharp turn that the country took, mm -hmm. the end of the Federalists, the Civil War, and the New Deal. And is pointing out that you can sometimes get a, com a, 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 rev a peaceful revolution that fundamentally shakes things up and says we, because our system is not performing in all mm -hmm. the ways Lee has just talked about, that we might be headed for another such moment. I do think, I don't know what role the debates can play in, in all this, probably some, and I'm, I'm as one commissioner, very open to some new approach. But um, uh, I'll, I'll say this, if, it's going to, if there's going to be a realignment, I hope it is a genuine third party, not just a man on a white horse third you know, candidate. We've got some on offer out there. Mm -hmm. Because those people will get absolutely nothing done if they come with no network, no constituency, other than, you know, one they scraped up in one election. So um, oh. uh, maybe liberalizing our laws that encourage the growth of new vehicles that could displace maybe one of the parties we have mm -hmm. and replace it with something uh, else uh, would be something to be wished for. Congressman, word, word is... The, the stu student had asked about where do they go for unbiased research? Well, there isn't any such C-SPAN. Look. They also raise the question of media diversity. We've had an explosion of media diversity. I think it's probably a good thing overall, but it's also confusing. Uh, you as a citizen and I as a citizen, we have placed upon us the responsibility of di making discriminating judgments about people, candidates, about policies, and we have to make those judgments. And the country won't work very well unless we do that. Now, we have to make those judgments on, on the basis of information given us, to us by the media. C-SPAN is a marvelous example uh, of doing it right. As, as, good as, uh, as good as any example I know. But uh, I would challenge you to read things other than people you agree with. Uh, try to stretch your mind a little bit and understand people that you disagree with and come to grips with it. There are all kinds of good sources out there if you just search for them. What do I read? I read the Wall Street Journal. I read the New York Times. I read the Washington Post. I read The Economist, I read all kinds of news magazines, uh, and I stretch myself constantly to try to read somebody that I don't agree with much, but I also agree, read those that I agree with. So I think it's a real effort we as citizens have to make to get the best information available, and it's not easy to do in a very diverse, multiplied, uh, multiplicity of sources. Media segmentation. Right, um, a, a, a term you hear all the time these days, and rightfully so, is confirmation bias. It's a problem not just in the space we're talking about here, public policy and public affairs, it's a problem in science and other places in which people uh, tend to uh, uh, avidly take in the information that confirms what they believe and tune out uh, or, or avoid through only going to the uh, preferred segments. Uh, preferred, it's not just your business, Brian, websites, all the rest. It's very, very easy now to fortify your, your biases and prejudices and, uh, and deny yourself, really, wall yourself off from um, troubling, disturbing, challenging information or opinion. I don't know what the, what the uh, remedy is. Um, uh, but it, it certainly, uh, a start can be, uh, uh, back to the point I made earlier, if national leadership were to more forcefully call for um, 
um, more open-mindedness and more uh, coming together at least around a few goals, uh, it might be a start. If you want to make the Congress work better, and that's been a theme of a lot of questions, one answer, I, two answers I would give. Number one, let the Congress work its will. When the majority leader, who happened to be a Democrat of the United States Senate, would not let votes come forward because he wanted to protect the membership from a tough votes, that's wrong. When you operate under the Hastert rule in the House, which says that we don't bring a, a bill forward, unless the majority of the majority caucus supports it. I think that's wrong. Let the Congress work its will. In other words, bring the bills forward and vote on them, rather than all these fancy maneuverings out here to stop uh, a clean vote on a particular bills. The second thing is Congress has to return to the regular order. We, over a 200-year period, the Congress of the United States developed a process of considering bills, subcommittee, committee, floor, letting the members offer amendments and all the rest of that, that is all gone by the boards. You now settle everything in a conference, uh, in a three o'clock, 3 a.m. meeting of the leadership. Most members are totally excluded from it. You put all kinds of issues into a single bill. Uh, the bill is uh, thousands of provisions in length. It's decided at 3 o'clock in the morning. You bring it to the floor of the Congress at 10 a.m. You have one hour of debate, no amendments. You vote it up or down. It is a process that is an outrage, and yet it has become the way of doing business in the United States Congress. We have to object to that. We're out of time. Thanks to our questioners and our group. <laughs>